Coming up, this band created one of the most sonically perfect records in rock history. But by the end of the 70s, they were stopped dead in their tracks by a legal battle that threatened to derail one of the greatest guitar and voice dominoes ever assembled. Uh, it took eight years for their third album to come out. And to make matters worse, their heralded uh, comeback single, it had been bootlegged and released to radio. And radio started playing it. Would anybody remember these guys after almost a decade out of the limelight? And would the release of this bootleg doom their comeback? Coming up next, the story of a 1986 miracle with an interview with one of the former band members. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever bought a brand new album and locked yourself in your bedroom, you know, when you were a little kid or even now, and listened to side A to side B on repeat for hours, telling you this is your channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now, click the bell so you never miss out on any of the episodes of the stories from the legends of rock and roll. We also have a Patreon. There you're gonna find more content and additional catalog of exclusive content. You can also become an honorary producer on the videos and that helps us curate this music history. And don't forget to check out our merch below, including our Vintage Years collection. Now, since 1955, songs with a one-word title featuring the first name of a female has unofficially hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 15 times. Now, to clarify, I'm not talking about songs that have more than a single first name, like Judy in Disguise by John Fred and his Playboy Band, or even Michael Jackson's monster hit Billie Jean. Just the singular given name of a female, and we're not even counting Rosanna here because it didn't hit number one. It happened for the first time in 1957 when it happened three times, beginning with Pat Boone's double A-side single Love Letters in the Sand and Bernadine. Oh, 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 Bernadine. Followed by Tammy, performed by actor Debbie Reynolds. Tammy, Tammy's in love. And then later in 1957, 15-year-old Paul Anka scored a chart topper with his song Diana. The last time a single word title with a female first name climbed all the way to number one was in 1986. And once again, it happened three times that year. Now the first in 86 was uh, Sarah by Starship. Sarah, Sarah. The name Venus returned to number one for the third time when Bananarama created Shocking Blue's original 1970 smash. The third time that a song with a female first name went to number one in 86 on the Billboard Hot 100 was also the last time that it ever happened. And this distinction goes to Amanda, the comeback power ballad for the band Boston. Amanda was written and produced entirely by Tom Scholz, the gangly six foot six rock and roll savant that formed Boston, and the mastermind behind the band's self-titled LP that became one of the biggest selling albums of all time. Perfect, just a perfect album. Now, Scholes began developing Amanda clear back in 1980. This was while he was battling a very contentious lawsuit with Epic Records, uh, the label that signed Boston, the war with Epic was just one of the obstacles that prevented Boston from releasing their third LP. Uh, there was also a wicked flood that damaged the studio and a massive power outage. Uh, another impediment was uh, Scholl's notoriously obsessive perfection. Uh, Tom's painstaking precision not only frustrated the record label, but it also exhausted his bandmates who were forced to work on solo projects and you know, other outside work to make a living while Boston went on an extended, extended hiatus in late 79. By 1981, original Boston members Fran Sheehan and uh, Barry Goodrow officially left the band with the underappreciated Brad Delp, the band's powerful lead vocalist, hanging on to the hope that Tom Scholz would eventually put the group back together again. Brad Delp accepted session work, including side projects with Goodrow. <laughs> Scholes himself pursued ancillary projects. He wanted to produce Sammy Hagar's Danger Zone album. 
And he uh, had one track titled Run For Your Life, ready to go. But actually, Epic prohibited him from officially taking the gig before Scholes delivered the next Boston album. It was brutal. Uh, Sammy's Danger Zone LP that was released in 1980, it ended up being co-produced by Sammy and uh, Jeff Workman. You better run for your life, girl. Now, behind the scenes, Scholes worked on new material for what became the third stage album, an extended reprieve from the rigors of touring and promoting a new record, it actually suited Tom Schulz just fine. He relished in the isolation. During this hiatus, uh, Schulz secluded himself in his hideaway studio. This is the site where he created the quintessential sound of Boston. That distinctive Boston sound was not, as the expression goes, a happy accident. It was the conclusion reached by Schulz after hundreds of listens to any musical part he recorded, no matter how short or seemingly insignificant. Schultz was fascinated with the process of engineering and design. He never got tired of honing and purifying every single note. The first song that Schultz wrote for the third stage album was Amanda. Unlike Marianne uh, that Schultz referenced in his lyrics for uh, More Than a Feeling, he didn't name the song after a real person, actually, Another band member tells us a little bit about that later, but the Marianne in More Than a Feeling was inspired by his real life older cousin, whom he had a secret crush on growing up. Amanda uh, was chosen as the love of his life because the name fit well with the song's lyrical structure. It's all about syllables, right? As Paul Simon says. Scholes tried other names, but Amanda rolled off the tongue a lot better. Amanda and the other tracks developed by Schultz for Third Stage marked a careful journey into a new era for Boston. I'm sure the music was fueled by Tom Schultz's purest approach of using old traditional rock and roll equipment. I mean, Schultz detested computers and heaven forbid he wouldn't be caught dead using a synthesizer in his music, but there were some notable modernizations in Schultz's arsenal. For example, Third Stage was the first time that Schultz used electronic drum samples it was actually the first record to feature Scholz's genius invention, the Rockman guitar processor. Rockman was the result of Scholz's constant uh, experimentation with guitar amplifiers, microphones, and equalizers. Scholz's uh, electronic box gave musicians the capability of modifying the sound of the guitar and other instruments, and it truly revolutionized the recording business. Throughout the verses of Amanda, we hear a chiming effect, like the sound of a church bell, or church bells. Uh, it gave the arrangement a gentle touch of romantic sensitivity. I don't think I could have that chiming was another example of the technical wizardry of Tom Schulz. Uh, the effect was created by the alteration of the sound of an electric guitar plugged into Schulz's Rockman. Scholz played every single instrument on Amanda. Uh, that includes the 12-string guitar. Uh, the liner notes on third stage also credited Scholz with playing lead guitar, bass guitar, grand piano, electric piano, Hammond organ, theater organ, thunderstorms, rocket, ignition, some drums, and unidentified flying objects. Love that. Despite that comprehensive list, though, Scholz managed to bring back some of the old familiar faces to perform on the recording of Third Stage, including uh, Sib Hashian. He was actually fired midway through the studio sessions and then original drummer Jim Mastia. And actually, I had a chance to speak with Jim about returning to Boston and the experience of working with Scholz on the album and Amanda. As we go into this little interview section, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Make sure that you download the new Zenny app right now to design your own frames and you know get their latest deals. This is where you can shop by shape, price, color, or style. Do it today, the Zenny app. That was a little bit of a risk too to, to put the first single out as kind of a, a power ballad rather than one of your big rockers. Right, sure. But it worked, that was fine because 
it made it more broad. It became more of a, you know, it wasn't just a rock and album. It was broader appeal. Something I just have to say. It was leaked early, and I think that kind of t gave the fans the taste. It was leaked a little bit, but they didn't get it. So that maybe even drove it. And another thing I remember hearing is the tour, the third stage tour was one of the most phenomenal tours in history of music. We had four sold out shows in every city. We were able to work five days a week. We would fly in like Tuesday, Wednesday, all the equipment set up. And it was incredibly cheap because we didn't have to break down. We were there for four nights. Right. Then we'd all fly and get on. We had a corporate jet. We flew home and we were home for two or three days. You know, it was, it was amazing. And again, the sold out shows, it was just, just amazing. But everyone was worried. They all thought they had sold it as the last tour. It was like the finale tour. It's going to be the last. So people went wild coming out, you know, and selling them out. And then the shows in Boston, it was nine, I think, nine sold out shows at the Centrum. Uh, no one ever touched that. Frank said, ah, no one could touch. It. We still have that record. What do you remember about recording Amanda? Do you remember how that track came together? Amanda is a little different. Again, Sib is involved. On the third album, what happened was Sib started some stuff. Then I, then he left. Tom brought me back. And then Tom discovered a problem, a technical problem. When Sib crashes, he hits his crash cymbal fractions of milliseconds ahead of his kick drum. Okay. I naturally hit my kick drum and then follow with the crash. So once Tom started listening to all of the tracks that he recorded with Sid, there were glitches because Tom was using a stereo compressor. The compressor is triggered from the kick drum. So what would happen with Sid is Sid would crash. The crash was not going into the mics. Then he hit the kick, and it would cause the, the compressor would clamp down and cause a glitch. Mm. We had to replay all the symbols. So on the third album, I'm playing all the symbols on half of it, where Sid is still playing, and then the other half I'm playing every. It was weird. Tom, it had become all about technology again. I was, I'm not proud of, it's a great, there's some great songs and, and it's a great album in many ways. But again, it's not the first album. It's not to have the same feel because Tom was so good with that razor blade that he removed me. He just used me as a drum machine instead of being inspired by what I played and then try to play on it. He would alter what I played to make it easier for what he wanted to do. He plays that solo, uh, the melody, just the melody of the song. Nee, 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 nee. And that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting because that you don't hear that very often. Was Amanda a real person? He just or did he just use that? Yeah, I don't think that would be it's, whether or not it was someone or I'm sure it, that's it's good for tone. Um, you know, it's an easy thing to sing pure tone with power shapes. So I'm sure more than likely he was looking for that. Then it was someone. Many have called Amanda Brad Delp's best performance because of his incredible vocal control and his tender conviction on this ballad. Uh, Delp's performance prompted Tom Schulz to give his down-to-earth lead singer much-deserved praise. He deserves so much more. In a 1986 interview with Musician Magazine, in fact, uh, Scholz gushed over Delp's incredible ability in the studio. Scholz called Delp a natural overdubber, perfectly matching what has been captured on tape. Actually, Tom would say he was a master at controlling his voice. He could do things over and over again, changing a note and then doing everything else exactly the same. He can sing harmonies with himself, uh, keep multiple vocal parts in his head. Together, it's now never. 
Scholes was laser focused solely on finishing Amanda to his complete satisfaction. He would not allow uh, label executives or anything else to rush him into releasing an album before he believed that it was truly as great as it could be. You know, this is a lesson that he learned earlier on Boston's second album, Don't Look Back. Scholes always contended that Don't Look Back was released prematurely because you know, he succumbed to relentless label pressure. I mean, to him, the record was woefully incomplete. Scholl's plan was to, to use Amanda as the gold standard of excellence to apply to the crafting of every other track for Third Stage. I mean, in many ways, Amanda was an ego track for Scholl's to prove to himself and to the world, really, that he could replicate the magic of Boston's phenomenal debut album. So the ongoing lawsuit between Tom Scholz and Epic Records, it reached a boiling point in early 1984. Exasperated by Scholz's delay in delivering third stage, Epic inflicted every tactic that they could think of to force Tom Scholz's hand, including uh, freezing the band's royalties earned from the first two albums. Really low. Scholz refused to compromise, though, and he held out for the verdict. The lawsuit was finally settled when U.S. District Court Judge Vincent L. Broderick ruled in favor of Tom Scholz and Boston. They were allowed to record their third album on another label, not on Epic. At long last, nearly eight years after the release of Don't Look Back and almost 12,000 hours of studio time, anxious fans were able to get third stage when it came out in September of 86 uh, on MCA Records. By the time the much-anticipated album dropped, millions had already heard Amanda, you know, the lead single from Third Stage. I guess a demo of Amanda was leaked to some album-oriented rock-formatted stations via syndicated satellite feed. It was uh, sort of a bootleg, really. Uh, Scholz and Delp, the two principals of the Boston Revival, worried that this bootleg airplay was going to be a disaster, especially since Scholz was such a, a stickler for perfection. You know, and the demo of Amanda was exactly that, a demo. It's unmixed and unmastered. Kind of got our grubby little claws on this from Rock Hits 94 YSP, Amanda. Even though the demo had really bad audio quality, listeners were so excited just to hear a new song by Boston that the demo of Amanda became the most requested song at every station that dared play it. The bootleg version of Amanda turned out to be a detonator for new Boston mania. After all, uh, not many bands could survive an eight-year absence, especially one that had only released two albums. You think about that. But hey, Boston was different. That sound, it's just magic. Now, a cease and desist was quickly issued to all stations that were playing the demo, leaving the audience you know, starving for more. MCA moved at warp speed to get the finalized Amanda out to radio. And when uh, the Shoals approved single hit the airwaves, it, it moved immediately to power rotation on its way to number one at uh, Mainstream Rock for three weeks. And it actually went to number one for two consecutive weeks on the Billboard Hot 100 overall. Track was also uh, number one in Canada, and it broke the top ten throughout Scandinavia. Amanda was one of the few singles that topped the pop chart without a promotional music video for MTV to play. Uh, there was a music video for Amanda that circulated in the UK featuring animation of Boston's trademark spaceship, but no images of any of the band members. In spite of the video play of the animated video in the UK, Amanda ironically failed to chart at all on the British singles chart. And of course, Amanda was another immaculate Tom Scholz production with the incomparable Brad Delp delivering uh, just a phenomenal vocal. It was a song about the expression of unfettered love that re-energized just another band out of Boston and put him back on the perch as one of America's greatest rock groups. Amanda rose to number one at several formats, and uh, by doing that, Third Stage rocketed to number one on the Billboard album chart, selling nearly five million units after eight years out of the limelight. Right, right, 
although it was a triumph for Scholes and Delp. The euphoria didn't last very long. The next chapter for Boston was, as baseball legend Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. Took eight more years for Boston to release fourth album, Walk On, and they would do so without Brad Delp. Blasphemy! Uh, he actually left the band over issues with Shoals and rejoined his old friend uh, Barry Goodrow to form the group RTZ. Until your love comes back Unfortunately, RTZ floundered and Boston with Fran Cosmo as the new lead singer, they'd lost their magic. I mean, for better or worse, the digital age arrived and the musical landscape forever changed. You know, with computers dominating the industry along with virtually every other facet of life, really. Like a big plate of comfort food, though, Amanda takes us back to the power ballad period of the rock era. Emotionally charged songs that made us sing to the top of our lungs, albeit in private. It was always cool to say that, you know, you didn't like the ballad. You liked the heavy rock tracks. At least that's how it was where I came from. If I You know, now whenever I hear those beautiful 80s ballads on the radio, I, I never change the channel. Even when I hear it on those 80s compilation infomercials from Time Life, it puts a lump in my throat and I long to travel back to that carefree time in the 80s. Amanda Rinks is one of the best power ballads from that time. The track is a shining example of uncompromising artistic integrity by its creator, Tom Scholz, and a showcase of Brad Delp, one of the all-time greatest rock vocalists who took us as listeners to levels that couldn't be put into words. They were just more than a feeling. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. It's true, though. And thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Boston and their 80s power ballad, Amanda. What do you remember about this song? You know, what does it meant to you? What do you remember about waiting eight years to get this album or to hear this song? New stuff from, from one of the greatest bands ever. If you dig our content, take a second to subscribe below. That way you'll never miss out on our daily videos. We'd love to have you as part of this community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.